Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Okay. Ah. So I wanted to show you. I'm wearing a little bee pin. Ah, <laughs> that's cute. <laughs> I don't have that much bee merchandise. Sorry, <laughs> or any. Somebody gifted me a bee shawl, but now I'm kind of yeah, my friend. And but now I'm you know I feel like. I don't want to wear bee merchandise because all the bee merchandise, like ninety percent of it, is like honey bees, right? It's the yellow right. and black. And now that I know that <laughs> there are so many more kinds of bees, I, I feel like bad. <laughs> no, so you should just get, you know, one of each bee. The more the merrier, then. Yes. All right. Thank you for joining, Sunanya. Thank you for joining, Maithili. Hi Sunaina, Maithili. I think we had more people for our test yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think people decided that okay, let's not waste our time over these two. <laughs> They were also test testing us. I wish there was a way to show us some footage. You can't, you can't show footage, no, on uh, Insta Live. No, I can't show footage. But uh, yeah, even I was uh, thinking if there was a way to show footage. But if you if you do like a Zoom thing, then it's possible to kind of uh, you know share the screen and share footage and photographs and stuff like that. But on Instagram, it's not possible. Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> Hi Sherry, thanks for joining. I was thinking it would be nice to actually show pictures. I don't. Hi Sherry. I don't even I have like uh, I don't have like these prints anymore, like we used to before when we were shooting regular DSLR and having like after every shoot we'll have like bunch of prints too, you know. Now everything is on the mobile <laughs> or can't hear you. Did you say something? I said yeah, things have changed so much. Yeah. Hi, yeah. Sunny. Just five minutes. Let's just wait for people to join. So, uh, in Madras during this time in Chennai, uh, do you notice beehives? More beehives coming in. Do people report? Is there? Have you seen stuff like that? Actually, I haven't seen beehives on trees in Chennai in ages. Like generally, where we are, unless you go to a a wooded area. Like on the street, although we have a lot of trees on our street, I haven't seen any beehives. No, but And do you, do you see that? Because, uh, the corporation here is very uh, regular with you know the mosquito spraying. I'm wondering if that affects the bees. Right. Do you think that? No. No. no so uh, do they have the? Uh, do they have? Uh, do you have like bees making uh, nests on balconies and stuff like we have in Bangalore? No, there are. I have a lot of wasps who do that here. But I haven't seen any bees. There are some wasps. You know the ones who do it on the switchboard. Yeah. And even on the cardboard boxes inside the cupboard, they use a corner, and they do that. I've mm. seen a lot of that, but I haven't. Uh, so actually, now that you mention it, I haven't seen. Sometimes when the plants are flowering, you'll see some bees, but not a lot. You know, in July we get a lot of butterflies. Literally, yeah. trees are filled with them, but. I haven't really seen a large beehive. You know, like the ones we see in Bangalore. Yeah. So because you know, I think they, uh, I think they are trying to like figure out this uh, migratory uh, route of uh, this is like it's not like I'm trying to find out, but I've heard people talking about it. So I'm also very curious. Just you know, 
um do they they trying to figure out where do the uh, bees really travel to do they travel during the monsoons you know it's a seasonal mons- uh, migration time so do they travel to the you know the west or the east uh, because east would seem more logical because if they are trying to move away from the rain so right. uh, can i also is the same distance wise it's the distance that they do travel they are are known to travel that much so i am just out of curiosity i thought to ask no i have seen these uh, like you know when you go a little bit out, outside the city and uh, then i i really have seen a lot but they have a lot of flowering plants but i rarely see bees like down yeah. here in hong kong you haven't seen any bees at all or like stingless bees not any but very rarely but not like a whole lot yeah okay sometimes we get the odd bee that flies inside and then buzzes and you know we get the hornet like a really big one the xylocopa the carpenter bee the black ones right right yeah khavara yeah. but not a lot yeah. like just one or something but i haven't seen that the yellow striped one for you So, <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah. Should we start? We still have a minute to go. Let's just wait for more people to join. Yeah, yeah. See some people joining. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Alrighty, let's just start anyway, and hopefully people will start joining yeah. in. Right? Great. Uh, I'm just checking with the volume moms team. Are we good to go? Shall we start? Mikey, Shani. Ready. <laughs> Okay so good evening everyone thank you for being here and i hope many more of you join in later and uh, when more people do i'll introduce our guest again so we are very pleased to for to have rajni mani on our second uh, insta live on the second insta live of the warrior moms and uh, rajni i mean there are a lot of things i can say about her and uh, i hope you know It looks like I have all my besties on every week, but what do I do? I just know that many talented women. So uh, Rajni actually studied with me in college, and she went to Jamia Millia Islamia, where she studied filmmaking. And then uh, the two of us together, we founded a, a film collective called Elephant Corridor, and uh, which you know we stopped making films. And I'm very very happy to announce that Rajni revived the company, and uh, she's coming back with a big bang, and she's uh, making a film on bees. It's called Colonies and Conflict. Please check out uh, the Insta page, Colonies and Conflict. And uh, she makes a film on bees. And there's so much more about Rajni apart from a filmmaker. She's an she's an amazing, very talented artist. You should check out her paintings too. And uh, she's passionate about the environment, right? And uh, she's normally she's very clued in and all things environmental. And she's also a doer, not just a talker. In her own colony where she lives in the gated community where she lives where correct me if i'm wrong rajni about 700 apartments we have 1200 uh, uh, 50 apartments right so 1200 yeah one sorry 1500 and something 40 yeah, yeah. sorry double the number i said not 700 but 1500 uh, yeah. apartments and she actually got a, a solid waste management program going there till then all the garbage was just being you know uh, thrown into the landfill and she got this wonderful system set up there so she is a doer she is able to persuade people and she is able to really you know uh, take action and that's the kind of woman we all want to get behind so welcome rajni 
and as you know and you are a warrior mom yourself so as you know and uh, just to let everyone else know we are a collective of mothers a coalition of mothers from all over india and uh, we're here to talk about the environment about pollution and particularly air pollution and how it affects us and our children right okay okay so rajni uh, the first thing i want to ask you is uh, why did you start thinking about bees because normally when we want to feature an animal in our films or documentaries we look at the big five or we look at something more more visible really right yeah so uh, what is it about bees yeah so uh, the the thing with uh, the bees was uh, that so you're right i mean you know we always we're looking at the bigger mammals we want to do stories they, they are much more exciting and you know there's a lot of risk and just as filmmakers also it's a great subject for us to make movies on um so when i set out it was there was no intention to make a film uh the the real issue was that um there were these large bee hives at that time i didn't know uh, the distinction between bees as well so there were these large bee hives in my apartment uh, it's a typical gated community in bangalore uh, you know with um, you know uh, 13 floor 14 floor um, high you know sort of me- medium high rise apartments and we would um, and people would be like uh, really scared of these bees and uh, they wanted to like uh, they were using pesticide sprays to uh, remove these uh, bees that's when i got really interested because you know for me uh, just because i'm a uh you know i love uh, all creatures you know like anything it was just to, to for me to see all these uh, bees fallen on the ground you know dead and squirming and all that it was just heartbreaking so i was uh, trying to figure out you know like how can what is the better way to kind of uh, resolve this because clearly it was a conflict situation right uh and um, and i started digging a little i wanted to know and p- there were people who were calling them killer bees right i was like what what is killer bees you know what do you mean by killer bees i had never i mean sound like out of a hollywood movie you know um uh, like that so i did some research and i met a few people and then i came to know these are dorsata bees uh, apis dorsata and then um and as i uh, dug a little deeper i realized that Uh, i also wanted to kind of um being a, a communicator i wanted to show a film to people about these bees so that we all educate ourselves we all know a little more about these creatures right and as i was looking for these films i found that there were no films there was uh, virtually nothing that i could share with my community or share with uh, other people who would like to know and um, so i said that uh, okay then i'm going to make a film and that's how the subject and the story literally fell on my lap um that's how it had happened and and i got really curious and and as i started talking to scientists uh i mean the the world of bees literally opened for me and i found them to be very exciting creatures actually and so beautiful and in their own tiny ways they were they were also um you know uh magnificent in their own way like they were doing big little things right i mean they are not as flamboyant as a tiger but they are flamboyant enough in their own way. i mean in the in the bee world you'll find the flamboyancy if you'll kind of go deeper you'll find that the dorsata are more flamboyant than the solitary bees that nest in the soil and you'd find these these little differences you know and they are very exciting for me yeah right so let's go back to what you were saying about the bee hives in your colony uh why were they being smoked out i mean uh, uh, why are bees stigmatized what what is yeah. the deal with that yeah so uh, with dorsata uh, apis dorsata which are also called rock bees um mm-hmm. they they are um, uh, they're slightly aggressive um, but that's their temperament and uh, while we seem to accept um you know like even a dog when it's angry is going to be volatile you can get a uh, bitten by a dog and you can die from that injury as well or a cat or or you know anything uh, that is wild is wild it has an inherent temperament to do uh, to behave um, uh, in a certain way in self defense right so bees are no different right so dorsata are more frightening because they are um, they are these huge bee hives sometimes you know from 2 feet to 3 feet large bee hives in size and uh, for people it would be like um, they they are these hives are hanging from their balconies 
right? And bulk, and they, maybe they want to hang clothes or something like that. And and of course, there are stories. I mean, if you ask anybody, uh, what what is the first thing you you um, you know think of when you think of bees? They'll say, oh, we are very frightened. They say, eat you, and they'll you know exclaim, and they're frightened of bees because of because bees sting. But the thing is, bees sting as a very last resort because the minute the bee stings, uh, it that's the end of its life. And it would do that only when its hive or its nest is under threat. Uh, okay, so there's a science behind all this. So there is a general fear of bee stings that the bee stings can kill you. Um, uh, so again, I, I can you know tell you that bee stings would um, can be fatal uh, for people with general allergies. If you are generally a person who's allergic in nature. And uh, you are, you know, you would know such people, you know, even an ant bite can give the trigger something for them. And, uh, you know, then you, yes, it can be fatal for you, but there are ways to mitigate that as well. Um, but generally, it's very difficult to escape that conditioning which has happened from childhood. We are scared of snakes. We are scared of bees. We are scared of wasps. I would say, don't be scared, be respectful. You know, understand them first know what is their nature before right. you know yeah absolutely Rajni. Uh, i think you have a point there but uh, you know living in cities as we do we are pretty disconnected from nature and all of us we do have some level of pest control going on within our homes right and and with the as with the bees when i lived in bangalore too i have seen you know these guys come in they spray them and then the entire stairway of your apartment complex is littered with dead bees Right. And uh, people say, yeah, we feel bad, but you know how to have it hanging there. You know, you have all these questions. So we do a lot of pest control. Right. And uh, we yeah. don't see as many insects as we used to. So why is it important? I mean, why should we think more about bees? We need to think about bees because, uh, uh, you know, they are providing a lot of ecosystem services to us, which is largely going unnoticed by people. Now, I have seen, um, I have experienced people removing beehives uh, and they would tell these uh, guys who remove them that, oh, that honey, I'm not going to pay you for this because the bee, may, uh, the hive was made on my balcony, so I get my share free. So for me, those kind of things are like appalling. I mean, you it suddenly became your pet, right? So, um, I mean, it was okay. It became your property because it was on your uh, balcony. So you're not going to pay. So you have no qualms about taking the honey. So there is a misconception that, and of course, it's um, propagated by humans, right? That everything in nature is there to service us, right? And so the kind of service that we take, uh, that we know of and we take from bees uh, is the honey. But without us realizing there's a greater service that the bees are providing that, that is giving us, uh, you know, uh, food providing for our... Um, nutritional security, our food security, and also the larger ecosystem services of pollination, protecting our forests, right? So these are all uh, what the bees give us. And we are just stuck on the honey part of it, right? So yeah, yeah just one, yeah. Let's talk, about, let's talk about food security. I remember one of your first films was uh, a film on yeah. uh, food security, right? Uh, yeah. Food and hope, right? Right, right. Uh, we worked with Dr. Vandana Shiva. And I'd like to bring you back to food security and bees. Uh, can you just explain that a bit more? Like what would actually happen if, if we lost yeah. bees? Because uh, at least in India, we don't hear uh, too much being said about bees in the agricultural sector at all. No, no. So agricultural colleges do not take a course on pollination. You know, and even entomology, uh, entomologists, you know, the budding entomologists who are going to these colleges, they are, from, this is from my knowledge, whatever I have gained over the last uh, two and a half years filming this, right? Uh, they are told, so entomology has become a subject in India um, to benefit pest control companies. Oh, you get it. So you are becoming an entomologist, so you can then control the pests in the field. They are not there to, to kind of make sure that pollination happens and then, you know, we, the, the, all kinds of insect diversity happens and that ecosystem is intact. They learn all of these, all about these insects only to go on to see, uh, to figure out how to control them. 
and that is the sad uh, you know fact about indian agricultural colleges like where where kids learn and uh, i mean if these guys who are specialists are going to go end up this way i mean people like us we are common people we we know barely nothing and in india pe- there has been very little discussion on all insects and uh, since i'm making a film on bees i can say definitely on bees so even the film like i was saying i was looking for a film there was no film about uh, bees and um, uh, like even the scientists are only now uh, conducting research and finding out more and more about our wild species so now coming back to food security um now food secu- uh, in a country like india food security you know we know that it's very important we we are you know we we have a large population that needs to be fed and uh, but then you know you have people who will say that look we are growing wheat and we are growing rice even government policies uh, regarding food um, security are focusing on grains and cereals uh, okay but uh, you can really eat uh, rice and wheat and still be malnourished because you need a variety of foods uh, like fruits and spices and nuts and uh, you know all kinds of vegetables uh, in order to be um uh, nutritionally um satiated and your body to be able to uh, you know be healthy so there is something beyond food security which is nutritional security okay and bees provide nutritional diversity to us so that we can enjoy on our plate a wide variety of foods that we are now uh, you know that we are used to or we need to because our children need to eat fruits and vegetables we are uh, if you see the population of india we our there's a greater population of the young people now and these young people need to be fed fed healthy food so uh, this becomes important you know to pay more attention to uh, to bees and their ecosystem services of pollination okay now here it's important because you know there are certain kinds of foods which need certain bees right oh, so okay. like for example uh, so it's not all bees uh, any crop yeah. it's not that way it's not like that so you have uh, among bees you have um, uh, social bees and solitary bees okay now uh, the social bees live in large hives they live together there are a large population of let's say tens of thousands okay solitary bees live by themselves all right and they would nest in dead wood uh, in soil um in nooks and crannies sometimes you know little reeds and stuff like that and they can be as uh, you know uh, depending upon so here there's another thing i'll just kind of die a little bit i'll jump onto this and i'll come back um now when plants evolved okay in our when we go back down to the pre prehistoric times when the plants evolved um they it was realized that that they don't have locomotion like us like like the mammals they cannot move so how do they propagate now the purpose of life is reproduction so yeah. how are they going to do that right so um they figured out a system which was mutualistic in nature right so these prehistoric bees would come okay on them and uh they would reward them by giving them like pollen or some nectar right and so then it became a system where the bees and the flowers co-evolved to form this kind of parasitic or mutualistic kind of a relationship over time okay and each flower then evolved yeah so they so they actually helped each other yeah yeah i there was a there was a call yeah yeah so each flower actually grew uh, evolved to accommodate a certain type of bee so they co-evolved right so you have bees that pollinate the tiniest flowers as well as flat flowers on which like like the sunflower on which the bees can also forage on and sunflower won't give you nectar but it gives you plenty of pollen and uh, bees require nectar as well as pollen for their nutrition and uh, energy uh, requirements and uh, the beautiful thing is that in in the process of getting this from the flowers the bees then take that pollen around and help to propagate the species of this particular flower right which it needs 
so they they figured this out i mean this is an amazing phase of evolution that has just passed us by that we haven't paid any attention to right intelligent um, design huh intelligent design yes and um, uh, so this is this this what happened so so what i'm trying to say is that there there are all kinds of uh you know flowers that require different types of bees to pollinate so tomato for example needs something called buzz pollination okay so the bees would land on the on the uh, on this anther on the flower and it would uh, shake its sh body so that the you know the pollen would spread okay and uh, now you i can't uh, you know of course so these sorry these solitary bees like uh, these um, you know uh, the carpenter bees the black ones you know um also called uh, they are called xylocopa they are all specialists right they have they are specialists they are there for specific flowers right and then you have the social bees which are generalists which will go on everything they will pollinate like they'll go and sit on everything and uh, they and that's important for them because you know they need a lot of food and they need a lot of nectar for their big hives with tens of thousands of bees right so they need all that much that they can collect they will go left right and center to do that yes, right? absolutely yeah but these other bees solitary bees which are uh, so uh, in the, in the world the of the 20000 plus bee species that there are 96% are solitary bees and all just um, you know 4% are honey bees which are the social bees and okay. in india we have our own uh, spe five species of honey bees out of that i have seen four in bangalore on my wow. lot yeah okay. and except one which is uh, you know in the northeast which okay. i haven't seen yeah you know so, i i read uh, i remember reading this article rajni a, a few years ago and it was so bizarre to me it said that in china there's been a lot of bee die off yeah right so what they have they have people with um, yeah vibrator actually pollinate they have these long sticks yes and then they touch from one flower to another they go about doing this and they are actually mechanically pollinating and okay. i was just thinking uh how weird have we become as a society that we can even yeah. think that we can live without you know um insects yeah. and now that you tell me that you know uh, it's specific even the manner of pollination is specific the type of bee is specific there's no way we can actually get the job done without them am i right no so uh, you you can't get the job done but we are doing a very good job of like you know pushing them over the edge uh, whatever numbers there are and there are already a number of uh, species uh, you know types of bees that are inst ex extinct you know and um, uh, yeah somebody is saying that yeah i've seen that uh, robotic <laughs> black mirror <laughs> uh, yeah that sounds like a black mirror episode yeah, like yeah, yeah i've seen that Maybe. episode of the one he's talking about and that was so bizarre for me when i saw that right and uh, we could well be heading towards that i i don't know it's not yet we're not there uh, but we can still rein ourselves in and you know we in india we are so unique because we are a tropical country we have great diversity and great numbers but even so i when i visited villages uh, you know trying to trace the migratory journey suppose it migratory journey i don't know if they do migrate those distances but just given a certain research study that ha that i had read and they said that the bees our sri lankan study says that we uh, dorsata bees can travel up to 200 kilometers so then i said okay it's 200 kilometers and somebody told me that you know uh, uh, in february uh, the uh, the coffee plantations um, flower in february march in um, cool i said okay sounds logical maybe they go there and so they have in cool they have these uh, large sacred groves called devrakard okay and um, devrakard are protected areas and they have these huge trees over there with wide spread canopies and large crowns wide crowns okay and uh, so the bees nest there and once you go there you see the wonder and that mystique of uh, of that place you know in the western ghats so um uh, that's so that's why I, i kind of i figured that maybe yeah maybe they are making the journey i don't know if they are and the villagers over there they would say that you know uh, 10 years ago we would have 30 40 hives now this year so the year i went okay they haven't come by you know till now 
and we should have seen few hives and the number of hives are like coming down we don't know the reason for that is it because of the pressures uh, the anthropocentric uh, world is putting on them or have they found better pastures or other areas to forage in because of the lack of food in, in a certain area or there could be number of reasons i mean we can i can speculate you know yes when you, when you told me about the lack of numbers the villagers saying that it took me yeah. back to when the two yeah. of us were filming in castle gold right. and uh, remember when they were spraying endosulfan aerially and yes. uh, there was a farmer we were filming with and he said uh, that uh, uh, for years you know his hives were empty he actually had those wooden boxes right and he said the hives were empty and because uh, it was in litigation and for one year they didn't spray and yeah. within that one year the bees his hives were full again the bees actually came back Right. i can never forget he proudly you know he removed the tray and it was just glowing with honey and uh, right so you uh, know and so just after one year of not spraying not so what spraying. do you think uh, are they resilient i mean is, is that right to say that and will they just come back or i think insects in by and large are resilient okay but um, to what extent are we pushing them and at what extent it would become just too much uh, i wouldn't be able to say but by and large we do know from experience that insects are resilient but at the same time nina we were discussing yesterday about when we were children right we used to see moths so many moths we don't see as many moths now you know we don't yeah. see as even many even that uh, thing it making the round on the internet do you remember that image you know yeah. Uh, yeah. going on road trip there be insects on the windshield so many and yes. i remember my dad stopping the car I'll have to get off and clean them off you know because yeah yeah they will literally so the be that in, in, see in, in like today i was reading something and uh, you know uh, somebody uh, had written or something or somebody said i don't know uh, that mm, like in india we have yeah 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 i was watching an interview yeah there was an interview uh, done by bbc on uh, priti karan i was watching that interview on cnn or bbc or something and uh, so she was saying that um, these you know the the kind of uh, india you know the, the kind of population that we have the wild and the humans are constantly there's a constant overlap right it's it's there all the time but we uh, in the in the cities we are not having that understanding or we are we don't want we are purposely kind of ignoring um the um the kind of uh, the wild around us there can be a wild in your little garden or in your balcony there is a wild in my balcony right absolutely But we don't we are not really paying attention to that we want to see the that there should be a national park and there should be an electric fence around it and the animals should be inside that uh two years back uh, you may remember that there were you know some birds migratory birds which had stopped over at my apartment building and yes, so i remember the picture you sent yes. there were hundreds of them there were starlings them. right starlings uh, right no they were barn uh, barn swallows they were barn swallows, barn swallows and right. we've never seen barn swallows in this area so i was thinking why are they here i mean they must have either lost a nesting perching site or something must have happened that they thought this seems like a good place a lot of perches let's just you know settle on the balcony we never had mosquito problems for those 3 months they were here huh, by the way and there were people bursting firecrackers saying that we are going to die of bird flu and you know i i was trying to tell them they will leave they will just please then somebody told me that you know that this is not masai mara and you know i mean but but on their balconies they will create a little island of little greens they'll pretend that you know this is our little green spot tropical jungle without animals or, or insects or birds other than pigeons pigeons are okay so you know this is this is the state of our cities now where we don't right so i'm wondering now with all the research and you're talking to scientists uh, so is there any sort of a, a concerted effort you know to bring about some kind of awareness among people you know in in because i also read an article where Uh, people have started you know bankers and uh, teachers and people with various jobs on new york on on the sky rise you know on those skyscraper yeah, buildings yeah. on the yeah. roof they they started beekeeping okay it's so, an amazing article uh, so because so they have thought about their urban diversity so is there some similar plan now in bangalore or so, or in india know, yeah so i 
uh, I was trying to understand the this uh, you know the whole thing of um, beekeeping, right? And uh, now that is different from conserving bees. Okay, because uh, when you are doing beekeeping, um, you are generally keeping. To, in India, you will keep two kinds of bees. Uh, either you have the Indian Apis serrana, which is a cavity nesting bee, or you will be taking the European bee, which is the Apis mellifera, which the government of India introduced into the country in 1983, right? So, um, how would uh, you know these bees? Um, uh, you know, so how would the native bees, which are ground nesting, how would they compete with right. these bees? Right. So that's. I mean, I'm still trying to figure this out. Okay, it's not very clear. I have. very good friends who are beekeepers and also conservation experts who know much more about it than me and um but from my understanding i think let's separate beekeeping uh from this and when you have something called uh, a project like uh, you know uh, i don't know bee project or honey project or whatever it is uh, if the government is coming out with such projects they should include all species of bees Absolutely. Okay. Don't. I mean, that one. If you if if you include that species, uh, all species of bees, then there will be larger awareness. Like I was telling you yesterday, why can't we have bee watching? You know, why can't we go into the garden and spot what are the different kinds of insects are we are we seeing today, and among them, which ones do we think are bees? Try to figure out using Google Photo app, so like face like you know recognitions. What are these species that you have noticed in your garden today? I mean that is an exciting thing. Every time we don't have to look in uh, up in the sky and to spot a very large bird or a you know mammal or something like that, we can do it. Just bees are there; they're very unique creatures, you know. We can um... absolutely because we're there. I I think what we're doing is, you know, we're developing, which means, you know, ruining nature. And then we say, oh, there are no sparrows. Oh, there are no bees. So let me plant a bee garden. Let me make sparrow food. You know, for sparrows to come yeah. back to. Yeah, we're doing that, and uh, but at a deeper level, we're not really connecting. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so we need to make these spaces integral to, you know, when we plan an urban area, we need to bring back these kind of spaces which yeah. are not away from the city or locked up spaces. They should be integrated yeah. into every street. Correct. Exactly. And with that, so, and with that, I'd like to tell our audience because we have, uh, like, I want to tell you, everyone who's watching that. Uh, Rajni is just so full of ideas. She also started this amazing initiative in Bangalore years ago, which unfortunately didn't pan out. Called uh, was it called Eat Your What What is it called? Eat Your Eat Your Street. Yeah, we were trying to eat your street. We and were also great with these. We were also great with these titles, by the way. Eat Your Street. So she actually went about planting vegetables and fruit trees just on the street. You know, yeah. in those uh, around the tree guards. The and uh, areas, basically. yeah in all the parambok areas right and that was just such a wonderful idea and uh, so rashmi you know you said something really beautiful you said um, i'm just reading it i mean i wrote it down actually you said don't be scared be respectful yeah so how can we live with bees i mean in your own a society of 1500 flats yeah. have you managed to get them to stop smoking out the hives and what did you do how how do what do you advise people what do we do Brikesh is asking, "How do we turn people's phobia for bees into respect? How do we do that?" Yeah. So what I have done is I can talk about that. Um, I have flooded people with information. Uh, I, <laughs> I I bully people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know I'm at the receiving end. That's why I'm laughing. I know all this. <laughs> yeah. so i um, you know i share information 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 so much so that they have to accept uh, you know uh, what i'm saying as the truth because they are they don't have an option because they can't tell me something that's in the river they have no answers right i mean i am answering their questions but nevertheless um, people some of the people are scared um, so i tell them um, there are some ways to uh, do this i don't want to use the word sustainable because though people say ha ha let's relocate the bees you know it's sustainable now you'll see in the film when it comes out how sustainable it is okay uh but not to villainize anybody's work but at the same time uh you will see that 
the the most sustainable thing to do is leave them alone they are migratory i'm only talking about dorsata bees they are migratory species they are uh, what is called um, philopatric which means that they will come back to the nesting site again and again and again right so they have specific things so uh, just they are there for 3 months don't use that balcony if you have multiple balconies in my society there are multiple balconies you can just close that balcony let the bees live they will leave once the you know seasonal either seasonal migration or if that food source the trees which are flowering at that time once they stop flowering they will leave on their own right so that's uh, a very sensible nice and yeah. doable thing yeah uh, yeah it's doable so you do that that's one thing now uh, second thing is by 4:30 in the evening draw your curtains these bees dorsata are so unique they are very different from other bees other bees are diurnal they forage during the daytime uh, but dorsata they are crepuscular they are quite active during dusk and dawn and they are particularly active during the full moon 3 to 3 days before full moon and 2 3 days after full moon because this lot of ambient uh, light right so they are active at night okay they are they they have been you know you can see them foraging right through the night sometimes especially on full moon nights uh, so what that means is um is that the environment is continuously benefiting from their foraging behavior right throughout so the best thing is that uh, you close the curtains because they get attracted to the light because they have that photo tactile or whatever it's called like they will go to the light and then they can't break away and then they'll just hit hit the light again and again right so um uh, they will do that so that's the nature of of these bees uh, so please do them a favor and don't put on your balcony lights close the curtains put up put a mesh and let them be for 3 months they will leave if you can't you're still scared the ones who are in which are already inside the house they are not going to bite sting you they are not going to sting you because they are stuck by because of the attraction to the light right and they are just going to go round and round and round till they fall down exhausted in the morning you will see all the dead bees on the uh, on the ground right so um so best thing is close your curtains draw your curtains make it dark uh, so that the bees don't come inside your flat um now if you are still scared because you have kids and you know you have been conditioned and you know it doesn't work out for you um when the bees come to make the nest when dorsata bees come to your balcony to make the nest uh, they, you they will come in clusters of 50 to 100 first right and they make these you know they kind of make a chain and they'll be hanging there it will be a small cluster at that stage if you are paying attention all you have to do is um light uh, an agarbatti or a herbal mosquito coil which is just neem or something like that you know just to create the smoke because smoke is a deterrent for them and if you do this smoke over two days they will feel that this spot is unsuitable for them and they will not make their um Hi. Okay. yeah their nest over there now let's say you want you want in town and the bees have made this very big nest and you you know you're allergic and you just don't want them around uh, then what you can do is um again uh you can light a agarbatti or a coil and keep below so that the smoke kind of goes towards uh, the the hive do that repeat this for 2 days or 3 days okay and then stop what will what will happen is that the the queen will stop laying eggs okay uh because they feel that this is not a good place and we need to move and they make a collective decision they are so fascinating everything they do is it's uh, you know it's a, it's democratic and uh, they take collective decisions regarding their hive so the hive function is like a single throbbing organism right and so the uh, the queen will stop laying eggs but they will not leave because they will leave after 15 days after all the brood emerges once the brood emerges they and they will wipe eat all the you know the honey everything they going to pull in they going to wipe it out and then they will leave that uh, nest site so you but this will again require a little bit of patience and so i would like to say for everyone who's looking for sustainable solutions to remove the beehive don't be under this impression that calling the bee re- relocator or calling the smoking guy the smoker is a sustainable way 
sustainable way is to not harm them at all not even one bee should die because of you or your actions yeah. or your intolerance yeah. or your fear right so yeah yeah so there are these other methods that you can adopt and uh, i i do try to share this information with people and you know in my my own uh, one of my friends who lives upstairs um now since the last 3 years she has not removed the hives and every year they come back and they the nests are getting bigger and bigger and oh, last they come year, back to the same uh, nest is it yeah, if you yeah. don't remember no 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 they won't come back to the same they will build another but if a nest has been built on your balcony their pheromones are already there and it's also the best location for them because maybe the foraging the sun rays uh, the what source of water may be close by so it's an ideal spot for them in any case right so that's where they chose it another very interesting thing that i realized is that i was talking about these tall trees and dorsata bee hives in childhood you may have seen them many of them on a water tank or something right yes and this, yes. yeah and if you go to forest you'll see them on cliffs many bee hives together or you go to the devra kada you see um like a tree with multiple bee hives right so this is the way dorsata lives they live in colony aggregates they live together they won't there is no cross uh, happening between the colonies but they live adjacent to each other like right? a gated community <laughs> like a like a gated community and and what is happening in the cities so in in my society for example when they are building bee hives in different on different higher floors but in the same society we are like that forest we are like that big tree where they are all the cousins are building uh, you know uh, apartments next to each other we are there and we are and when we cleared out the the big trees and their habitat to make our large apartments we have given them rocks artificial rocks to build on we are providing them all these things we have given them a welcome carpet you know so where do they go they don't have trees. they don't have trees uh sherry is asking you know since monsoon is around the corner yeah what, and people want to plant at this time what should we be planting to encourage or to bring these back um actually uh you don't really need to plant anything specifically for bees uh bees uh, you know different bees forage on all kinds of wild flowers and stuff you can you can actually have a little corner of corner space with just random flowers and like touch me nots clover and that kind of stuff growing and uh, of course if there are uh, flowering trees with uh, you know uh, you can just see in your area which are the flowering trees um like in the western ghat region so you have the nandi trees you have the jack fruit you have stingless bees love mango uh, you know so different bees prefer different kind of sometimes trees. you see them even inside the mango right Yeah, that I, I'm not. Nandu. I don't know. In Tamil, we call it nandu. It's not really a bee, right? It's a. No, no, no. I think it's something else. I'm not really sure about what that is. Yeah, I've heard about that. So it's a kind of wasp, maybe. I don't know. But yeah, like, it, fly, it flies out. Like you'll be eating your mango, yeah, and suddenly it will knock. And yeah, it's because they've laid the egg, and I think it kind of, you know, I I don't know about the mango one, but there are something called fig wasps, which kind of are inside figs. and uh, you know so but I, i know i have seen this and maybe i have experienced it also in the childhood but uh, i don't know what they they are but so there are different trees you sh- you should pl- plant trees which are uh, you know uh, uh, local and um, indigenous to your region and wild uh, plants and one more thing you know you were talking about beekeeping and i just want to add something there you know you if you uh, yeah if you like to do beekeeping why not do it i mean one or two bee boxes in your you know this thing is it's going to be good only it will give you an experience also to deal with these insects uh but you can also do something very exciting called bee hotels okay now bee hotels are you can just look online you will find all these reeds and you know all kinds of you can take like a pvc pipe and you can fill it with reeds and you can hang it somewhere somewhere woody kind of some area and you will find over time you know carpenter bees nesting um leaf cutter bees nesting inside them right so uh, those are you can provide habitat like that one of the things nina in the first film food health hope uh you know when and as making that film and it's only now that uh i was not really focusing on insects at that time okay um and uh, i was thinking that i was thinking about microorganisms and all that and, you know in the film we talk about monsanto right and we talk about this uh, particular product which is a herbicide called uh, roundup uh, roundup ready 
round up yeah, round up round up right? sorry mm-hmm. round up round up yeah so if you if you and people are people are spraying round up everywhere here also they were and i put a stop to that also but um they will uh, if there's too much grass or too much thing they are just going to pour the round up to get rid of all the weeds in coat on coat weeds right wild wild plants uh so i i'm thinking now that imagine because now i understand that there's a there's you know there are there are um soil nesting bees that live inside we are just making an entire area completely incapable of uh, sterile of you know sterile <laughs> yeah not and not just sterile but also like uh, it was a it was a habitation it it hosted creatures that you couldn't see and just to remove those wild plants because you didn't like the sight of it or it was bothering you or something uh you know you just uh, poured stuff all over it right so yeah sachi i want to talk to you about something else you know as warrior moms even if people yeah. are not part we are all very concerned about our children and in turning uh, our cities into such sterile places like you just described you know many children are actually frightened of nature they frightened yeah. of ants <laughs> they don't like the textures uh, is this a is, is this a real thing i mean is or is it just have you seen a lot it's of that because i know do a lot of advocacy and yeah no no it's a real the children don't know they don't know the smell of tomato plant you know tomato has a very unique smell the plant so when i was doing the gardening with the kids um you know uh, in a community that i lived in before uh, the kids were very excited and i was telling them you know every plant has a unique smell can you smell it can you recognize it so it won't children didn't know children don't know these things my own daughter used to be like uh because she was raised in the middle east um in these kind of uh, air condition environments she herself was in the early years um was scared of things like butterfly you were like what is this creature like you know she thought i don't know what she thought and it was very horrible for me because you know like I, what have i spawned you know it <laughs> it was like that for me so they <laughs> dance but 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 the victory for me was that um i took her on a bee uh, to a bee farm to my friend apurva's bee farm in bangalore um and uh, she saw the first hand you know and of course they were that, that could be a nice way to introduce children to the to the world okay maybe everybody is not like uh, uh, going to the wild and you know all that okay take them take baby steps introduce them to what they are comfortable with uh, when they take that when they see the this thing point out the queen show them the drone let them touch it drone won't sting you know all of that and then they realize and then um because she would see me all the time talking dorsata sharing info this that and for for a bit she even uh, you know even applied for a job which i had an advertised to be my social media manager uh, all of that happened <laughs> and one day there was um a dorsata which had entered my uh, my home and uh, so we could hear the humming right it was hitting itself against the light so we were inside and she was like what is that noise she went out oh it's a dorsata and she was very cool we went about you know turning off all the lights we knew what to do we put on the balcony light turned off all the lights and opened all the windows it it flew away it flew outside right so that was a big victory for me that she isn't uh, she yeah, has normalized yeah Not these are the fear. creatures that are uh, you know around us so right. i think uh, to kind of answer that question how do we get rid of uh, you know how do we to getting rid of fear is going to be it will take time because it's years of conditioning it's a conditioning from childhood because you've seen your grandmother also react in a bad way you've seen your mother react in a bad way you've seen your you know cousins been being stung and then people like this thing so it will take a long time to for you to form your own opinions and then allow yourself that educate yourself there and nowadays there's no excuse for not knowing stuff because everything is there on the uh, you know on google in our times we had to like open big fat encyclopedias to understand stuff you know so, another thing uh, i really want to ask you rajni which i think is very important and uh, you know because you know as warrior moms we do a lot of awareness campaigns and uh, and sometimes we come across as as really like you know fighty shouty people but you've managed to convince like 1500 families to segregate their waste and now you're you're doing the same thing with the beehives in your colony 
how do you approach people and how do you talk to people without getting into a fight and without burning bridges because i feel that you do that so beautifully yeah see you have to make allies that's the first thing you have to make allies and you have to also know uh you know that give give the, if these allies hold an important position in the community let them take the lead so i am very happy to step back and not ha- be the face of every single campaign because um uh, it's good if someone else is doing the stuff i just need to like put the right word across so i i i always believe in the previous community where i lived as well as here i created allies who were my friends who were easily is for easier for me to convince because they were already half convinced they just needed a little push and um then we created these groups within our community you know of uh, these powerful women and few men as well powerful in the sense that uh, they are not like uh, they are normal people but they are persistent and passionate right right they are dedicated and if there, this is a cause that you need to work towards they are quite uh, uh, you know um they are persistent to work towards that they don't get bogged down by small things easily right so this was the first thing that we did second thing is information from my end i have uh, if so especially when it comes to environment or you know let's say here um with the waste segregation or uh, with the bees beehives i am a bully i can be quite pig headed and like i said i just inundate them with information first then i have my allies who are with me right and we all work together so and we divided ourselves into little groups we found one representative from each tower of our huge society and that's how we started like slowly going from house to house uh, educating people and when when people are not like there there are some very tough people who don't want to segregate and uh, they have they don't want to touch their kachra and they don't want to wash their garbage and uh, bins and all that that's uh, so then i talk to them and i use my convincing powers <laughs> to, to <laughs> you know see the other way and no, then, but, then we ha- yeah but, and then we also have stuff like we don't do it and we ultimate thing is that we won't pick up your waste uh, we won't you know we are not going to be there for you uh if you don't do a small thing for the you know uh which will benefit the the earth right i mean no longer can we afford to think about me my flat you know now we have to th- think about all of our the humanity and the planet together ha i lost lives on this planet right yeah all, yeah right yeah no right and uh, finally rajni i want to uh, talk to you about bees and air pollution there have been some studies linking it can you tell us more about that please yeah so um in bangalore they in ncbs um dr shannon and uh, geeta uh, they are two scientists in ncbs and they have uh, done some studies and uh, with regard to my film i had met them and uh, and then i came to know about their uh, very um, kind of important study that they uh, they did and they they have created an air quality in, index for insects and they use the dorsata bee as an indicator as to the, to do their study on right because it was a bee that was kind of visible and they could uh you know it was there in different parts of the city all of that and uh, when they collected samples of of the bees and they put them through under an electron uh, microscope uh they found them covered in rspm right uh in india we very frequently use we are very familiar with with this word called rspm which is respiratory uh, suspended particulate matter right and it, it it's basically a collection of all kinds of like toxins and as well as dust and all of that so what would happen really is that um these insects when they covered in these kind of heavy metals and all of that they lose their some of their senses right they can't a maybe find their way back to the nest they may get lost maybe they can't pick up on floral scents so it would increase the mortality of 
the hive whichever bee type you're talking about now if it's a solitary one it's worse because it's just one uh, maybe you know uh, in, in that nest there maximum will be 20 or 30 uh, relatives but in social bees there are still larger structures right so this particular study was done taking the dorsata and this is what they found out and uh, one thing with respect to dorsata is that um uh these are migratory species right so they are going across various landscapes what you're doing here is affecting some pollination or some service they're providing in in a, in a field or or maybe in a forest right so, so have, uh, if the, if our city is polluted just to make that very clear if our city is polluted it's actually affecting a lovely village somewhere else that actually yeah. providing us with food yes so when the bees go there they are affected by the air pollution here yeah and they are unable yeah. to carry out their functions they are not uh, yeah maybe they are unable or maybe that hive is uh, you know mortality is higher in that hive does that hive survive so these are kind of questions i don't have answers to but we can one can speculate would it then make that journey to that forest where a certain kind of flower is opening waiting for uh, you know uh, pollination by this particular kind of bee you know and maybe a kind of a herbivore is dependent on this kind of plant i'm just building the picture so no and an- another thing that comes to my mind when you said this is you know uh, when i was in college and you know we at that time we st- we studied that you know when it comes to uh, indicators so water is polluted and you find uh, you know uh, bird deformities in tadpoles for example you know two headed tadpoles or, yeah. or or anomaly in the limbs Yeah. and uh, uh, you know and then even in castle goat that's what we saw with endosulfan yeah. they said that yeah. earlier to the animals who were affected there were deformities and soon yes. the babies who were being born they had very very obvious physical right. issues right and yes. with air pollution also we know that uh, if this is happening to the bees it may very well be happening to our children yeah in fact studies already say that uh, air pollution you know you live in uh areas with higher pollution your cognitive abilities are affected are coming down yeah so it is affecting uh, creatures at every level i mean right from like uh, you know uh, insects to uh, warm blooded uh, mammals like humans right so we don't consider ourselves as an animal that's that's the biggest problem the uh, so. found is absolutely fascinating especially about the insect aqi and i'd like to invite you to write for our blog you know just a little bit Yeah, I right? can do that. But uh, I would. Uh, I, I, I think that's I important for us all to understand at greater length. So whenever you have the time, if you could do that, that would be wonderful. Yeah, sure, sure. Right, and uh, I think we, yeah, it's our time is almost up. And Rajni, this has been like a, a really beautiful conversation where I think you highlighted that the littlest of creatures play the largest role in our in our ecosystem, and we have to be so mindful. Yeah. We can't, you know, uh, to look at the really big picture, we have to look at the littlest person or thing there, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. So, and good luck with everything, and dying to see your film. So, wh- when is it coming out? When do you hope to? I know the I know that COVID has uh, has yeah. really did this thing. It's delayed uh, because uh, you know also that uh, the film, uh, whatever we do, it's uh, it's also dependent on seasons, right? And I was uh, there was a little bit like about. uh you know 5 6% which was to be shot in the forest which was my last sequence uh in the in may and uh, i have uh, missed that completely uh so now i don't know but we have started the post production we will see maybe by year end we should uh, be out with the film so okay. i think you have missed a question i was just looking through the questions i missed one uh, someone wants to know priyam vada wants to know what happens when a hive is removed and the queen is allowed to fly away with the worker bees how does this impact the hive no so the queen is going to if the queen is uh, you know uh, rescued or whatever i mean she is allowed to fly away with some workers and she'll make another hive but you know yeah. it's a you have to understand building a hive is very in- energy intensive it's like you are building your home right but and they are doing it without any carbon footprint like it's green <laughs> as green can be and right so uh, why would you i understand that it seems like a simple thing she can go i mean you know you are she's free to go and she will build another hive and she will multiply again and again and you know she will i mean reproduce and she will have her colony in some time 
but uh, yeah, but then the implication is that she's doing it all over again. So just right. that, yeah. But uh, thank it you would so be, much. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> You're doing it first, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, please, Rajini, uh, those thank who want, you so much. Uh, those who want uh, updates on the film, please uh, follow me at Colonies in Conflict on Instagram. Uh, uh, Colonies in Conflict film on Instagram. Yeah, Colonies and... in Conflict, and you can also check out Rajini's artwork. I I forget that handle, Rajini. <laughs> I want everyone to see your art. <laughs> yeah, that's on my personal page. You are welcome yeah. to join my personal page, but don't ask personal questions. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. So thank you so very much, Rajni, for being with us, and we hope to have you back. And I'm going to hold you to that blog article for us yeah, on sure. QIN. Right. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining thank us. You. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye. Bye. -bye.